all groups, but indeed with a particular person. Earlier on in this 10th chapter, Jesus interacts with the rich young ruler. And again here in these closing verses, Jesus interacts with an individual. I can remember a number of occasions when, because of my wife's involvement with social work, uh, I would be compelled to watch with her television programs relating to various children, young people, going through times of difficulty. And uh, as we watch those programs, perhaps thinking to some degree about the balance between nature and nurture, it would also be an insight into the background of the child and the family situation in which they found themselves. And I guess in some ways that sort of program is similar to perhaps sitting in a cafe or being on a train and doing some people watching, observing how others react and behave. But as we come to this passage of God's word, not only do we observe the individual, but also because this is God's word and because Christ is God's son, this is his word to us, not only to observe, but also to apply. And so in these closing verses, we learn of an incident that occurred around the same time as in Luke 19, Jesus meets with Zacchaeus. And you hear it's a poor man and his name is Bartimaeus. The verses begin with the statement, they came to Jericho. Jesus visited places and people and by his spirit we believe this morning that Jesus would come and meet with us here in this place. So I want to think about these verses under three very simple headings. And the first is this, his situation. It's here in verse 46. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving Jericho, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. I want you to imagine with me the situation. I want you, as it were, to smell the coffee. Jesus is with a large crowd, probably pilgrims going up to Jerusalem. I don't know whether they were dancing, but almost certainly they were singing. They'd have been singing the Psalms of Ascent, Psalms 120 through to 134. And alongside the gospel record of the many, Mark records the individual, a lone man, seated by the roadside, probably near to the city gate, and before whom Jesus and his disciples pass by. It's interesting that Matthew and Luke also record a similar situation. Matthew speaks of two blind men. Luke speaks of one blind man but doesn't name him. But Mark is certain. This man is Bartimaeus and this man is blind. He cannot see. He cannot see his own appearance. He cannot see his undoubtedly dishevelled condition. He cannot see what lies immediately before him. He cannot provide for himself. He cannot earn a living. And since there is no welfare state and no benefit system, this man's only hope is to beg. And so Bartimaeus sits at the roadside begging. And as he sits there, no doubt the dust of men and beasts and the heat of the sun and the force of the wind all come upon him. Sometimes in a game, we can be blindfolded for a few moments. But for Bartimaeus, it was like that all the time. Every minute of every hour, every hour of every day, this man could not see. The Bible tells us that every man and woman is born spiritually blind. David captured it in this phrase, in sin, he said, did my mother conceive me? In other words, sin is not simply something that we do or fail to do. It is inherent within our very nature and being. 
we struggle in our blindness to see ourselves as God sees us. We cannot cure ourselves or remedy the situation. We cannot provide for our own salvation. Ultimately, our only response can be to look to Jesus. To be physically blind is sad. Deprived of the ability to observe the beauty of creation. To behold the accomplishment of a work of art. To see the features of a loved one. To be spiritually blind. To be blind to God and our need of him the Bible says, is fatal. Do you feel weighed down by pressures and demands? Bartimaeus must have felt like that. His world was a world of blindness and poverty, with the worry of how to survive day by day and the continual pressure of no end to the worry. Yet, praise God, this is a good news story. For Bartimaeus, there comes a day when Jesus of Nazareth comes by. And his burdens are lifted and his life is changed. And my friends, I want to say to you this morning that for you, this can be that day when your blindness is lifted and your life is changed. So firstly, this man's situation. I want you to notice, secondly, his senses in verses 47 to 50. And by senses, I mean his hearing and his speaking. Word of God tells us that Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. This man's ears were his eyes. Previously, no doubt, he had heard reports of this man Jesus and all that he had done. And now he hears a lot of noise as a large crowd milling around. He knows something is up. We would seek today by our worship, by our witness, to let the world know that Jesus is alive and is here. Bartimaeus knows that Jesus is here that Jesus is alive, and so we're told he begins to shout. He recognises that this is his opportunity. You see, Jesus, though Bartimaeus is not aware of it, will not come this way again. The Saviour is on his way to Jerusalem and to death and to Calvary. This, for him, is his only opportunity. And for us this morning, our presence here means that this is a day of grace, a day of opportunity, even a day of salvation. Bartimaeus could not run ahead and climb a tree. He could not push his way through the crowd. So Bartimaeus calls out. His voice is all that he can use. And so he begins to shout, we're told, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Notice that call. It's not Jesus of Nazareth, but Jesus, son of David. This man is using a messianic title. He's recognising that Jesus is the promised one, that he is the saviour, that he is indeed the son of the living God. And Jesus accepts this title as he's on his way to the cross. Bartimaeus cries humbly, mindful of the needy position he's in. And we, if we are to truly come to Christ, need to cry humbly. You see, we do not do God a favour when we come to Christ. The angels in heaven rejoice when a sinner comes to repentance, we're told, not through some sense of self-achievement like a salesman closing a deal, but rejoicing that one has come out of darkness into light, that one has come from a destiny of hell to a destiny of heaven. And what happens as this poor blind beggar shouts? We're told many rebuked him and told him 
to be quiet. The issue of begging, the existence of beggars in the United Kingdom on our streets is sadly often in the news, and so it should be. And this is the case, so often these things are far more complex than the media soundbite would require. A lack of affordable housing, mental illness, accessing long-term accommodation, demands of feeding and addiction, possession of pets, attraction of financial donations. But this passage does challenge us. How would we have responded to Bartimaeus? How do we respond to the social issues around us today? How do we display the love and compassion of God in practical ways? Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. You see, the people with Jesus didn't want the Saviour to stop. Those making their way along the road, those walking with Christ, those gathered, they, they wanted to hear great teaching. They wanted to observe miraculous power. They wanted to see if this was indeed the leader who would remove them from their oppressors. Bartimaeus was unimportant in the eyes of the crowd. Of no consequence. A man of no significance. My friends, when men, men and women and young people begin to show an interest in spiritual things, the evil one is not happy. And the world around us, our relatives, our friends, our workmates, our neighbours, may begin to label us as a Bible basher or a religious fanatic. We will be discouraged. Many may rebuke us and tell us to be quiet. Bartimaeus shouted, and the word of God tells us he shouted all the more. If you have begun to really listen to the word of God, if you are seriously concerned about your need of Christ, then take note that obeying the crowd, succumbing to the pressure of those around us, going with the majority, will seriously damage your spiritual health. For Bartimaeus, if he'd gone with the crowd, it could have meant the loss of his only opportunity to meet with Jesus. Many of those around Bartimaeus had their sight and their employment. Many of those around Bartimaeus neither felt nor saw a need to come to the Saviour. But Bartimaeus, through his circumstances, through his blindness, through his poverty, through his self-awareness, looks beyond himself and his own resources and is blessed. I want to ask you this morning, are you prepared to do that? You see, this man had no dignity to defend. He had no reputation to lose. He had no friends to help. He had no wealth to hinder. Do those things come in the way of you trusting Christ? That your friends are actually a discouragement. That you feel that somehow coming to Christ is beneath you. That somehow you want to earn God's approval. Do good works. Even come in the service of the church. And in reality, all he wants is you and me. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. This man shouted all the more, and amazingly, wonderfully, we're told Jesus stopped and said, call him. Think of the situation. The Saviour has set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem. Jesus is burdened with thoughts of what lies ahead of, lies ahead of him. Jesus is conscious of the approach of Gethsemane and Golgotha. Yet he is concerned for others. Bartimaeus, unimportant in the eyes of the world, 
but significant in the eyes of Christ. So significant that he spends time, shows care, grants healing. You know the wonderful thing is that Jesus this morning has time for you and me. If we're lonely, if we're worried, if we're depressed, if we're rejected, if we're anxious, if we're fearful about the future, my friends, Jesus is concerned. You see, in the midst of all the noise, Jesus heard Bartimaeus' cry. And in the midst of all the noise of the world in which we live, Jesus hears our cry today. Christ, the omniscient, all-knowing Son of God, Christ who knows that Bartimaeus will be on that roadside as he passes by, just as he knows you're here this morning. You notice the crowd so easily swayed. Soon as Jesus spoke, they turned to Bartimaeus. What a pity, what an indictment that they had not been concerned before. Cheer up, they say, on your feet, he's calling you. I do not think for a moment that those words were words of genuine interest or great concern. They have a hollow ring. The crowd did not really want to take time and trouble with Bartimaeus. If Jesus must pause, then let it be brief. They desired this interruption to be over with as soon as possible. We are truly Christ's disciples. We must always have time for others. Whatever their status, whatever their dress, whatever their situation. We must not allow our thinking to be moulded by the attitudes of our society. We are to be clothed with compassion, says the Apostle Paul. So Bartimaeus hears the call of the Saviour. In verse 50 tells us how he responds. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. His cry has been heard and Bartimaeus wastes no time. He jumps to his feet. There is the impression here of a newfound energy. So I want you to notice this. Throwing his cloak aside. Bartimaeus throws off that long, no doubt, tattered cloak. That cloak that had afforded him protection from the heat of the day and the cold of the night. This cloak that was one of the very few belongings owned by this blind beggar. And he tosses it aside. I've asked myself the question, why? Perhaps it is that he was ashamed of it. Undoubtedly, there are things we need to throw off that we are ashamed of when we become aware of our sin in the presence of God. Perhaps it was that the cloak hindered his walk, that he recognised the danger that it posed that it might trip him up on his way to Jesus. My friends, are there things in the way that would trip you up as you come to Jesus? things that stop you from coming to the foot of the cross. It may be a a personal relationship, it may be your social life, it may be moral matters, it may be selfish motives. Things that need to be thrown aside if you're going to come to Jesus. This man throws his cloak aside. Even for those of us who are believers, followers of Jesus, There are things to be thrown aside, things that hinder our walk with God. You see, it was one of the few precious things that Bartimaeus had. It was needful. It had legitimate uses. But this man sacrifices it. He might come to the Saviour and be blessed. If you will come to Jesus, there are things to be given up things to be laid aside, 
things that are hindering you thus far in seeking the Saviour. Starting the Christian life means giving up in order to receive. Firstly, his situation. Secondly, his senses. Thirdly, his salvation. He jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Wherever Jesus is, physically in Jericho 2,000 years ago, spiritually in New Milton this morning, there is a response, a reaction. Bartimaeus came to Jesus. No other way of salvation, no other name by which we can be saved, no other means of entry to heaven. What is your response? Will you come to Jesus? Saviour is calling. There's something of a surprise in this Bible passage. It's here in verse 51. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. It's the same question that Jesus had asked earlier in this chapter to James and John. And at first glance, it seems a strange question, doesn't it? The circumstances appear so obvious. Bartimaeus no doubt makes his way unsteadily and with arms outstretched towards him. Could the Saviour not see the situation? But there is, I would suggest, an important lesson here. You see, for one thing, we can get to the place where we almost enjoy or at least embrace ill health. It has become entwined in our identity. It has become who we are. We can become so tuned in to a particular role, so settled to a particular location, so institutionalised to a particular pattern of behaviour. Whilst we might talk of longing that things might be different, in reality we are scared of any change challenged at the thought of a change in our circumstances, a difference in our situation, an alteration to our pattern of life. Of course, it's not only fear of change, it can also be simply enjoyment of sin. We need to need Christ. We will not become a follower of Jesus until we recognise that we need to need Christ. You see, whilst we have no understanding of our sinfulness, no understanding of God's holiness, and no understanding that out of those two truths will one day come God's judgment, we have no need of Jesus. We need to come to that place where we need, need the Saviour. My friend, if you go out from this place unsaved this morning, it is because you have not asked the Saviour. What do you want me to do for you? Christ wants us to express that need, that desire. It's not simply enough to say, yes, I go along with what the guy at the front is saying. We cannot get into heaven on the back of someone else. Jesus wants us to express our faith. What do we believe Jesus can do? What do you want me to do for you? Rabbi, says Bartimaeus, I want to see. This man knows his need and this man believes that Jesus can meet it. You see, I think behind the question of Jesus, he is aware that Bartimaeus may have another request. He may be asking for finance. He may ask for a new cloak. He may ask for a better location. Is this man really serious about his greatest need? Yes, he is. Rabbi, I want to see. And this morning I need to ask you, 
are you really serious about your greatest need? The need to be born again. The need to be right with God. The need to have Jesus as Saviour and Lord. This man came to Jesus. It's possible to know a lot about the Bible. It's possible to come to church and worship regularly. But have you come to Jesus? Have you come in confession of sin, repentance and faith and asked him to be the saviour and lord of your life? If you have, then I would say to you that every day as a believer, Christ comes to us with this question. What do you want me to do for you? What would we ask the Saviour to do for us today? A burden to be lifted, a coldness of heart to be warmed, equipping with gifts that we might be more effective in his service. What do you want me to do for you? Isn't it lovely how the Saviour meets with us personally, individually? What do you want him to do for you? today the man for whom nothing is impossible is our spiritual sight weak have we settled for second best is our sinful lives hampering our view of the saviour what do you want me to do for you how can by my holy spirit says jesus be at work in your life sinclair ferguson said His request for sight was the evidence that he believed Jesus could provide it. Bartimaeus encountered Jesus' power not on the basis of his strength, but in the context of his weakness. We need to recognise how weak we are in order to receive the strength that only Christ can give. So Jesus makes his response. Go, he says to Bartimaeus, your faith has healed you. You see, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Good works cannot earn our salvation. So it is that Paul makes that great statement in Ephesians 2. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. God has given Bartimaeus two gifts. He's given him the gift of faith. and He's given him the gift of sight. For immediately this man received his sight. The great transaction is done. In a moment Bartimaeus receives his physical sight, but even more precious, his spiritual sight. The love, compassion, power of Christ are revealed. As Isaiah had written, then will the eyes of the blind be opened. And so it was. This man would agree with John Newton. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Jesus answers your plea. What are you going to do? Bartimaeus received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Luke adds that he went praising God. It was not a soft option. It was not a future insurance policy against bad things happening. Meeting Jesus changes us. To become a follower of Christ is radical. Bartimaeus is a forgiven man with a new confidence. New desires to be in the presence of the Master. New company to be with the disciples. New ambition to be a wholehearted follower. Jesus still passes by. Jesus still comes to where men and women are. The wealthy young ruler in the penthouse and the poor old man in cardboard city. And he comes. He meets needy people. He asks, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus still 
give sight to the spiritually blind and life to the spiritually dead. Jesus still calls ordinary folk, folk like Zacchaeus and Bartimaeus, the rich and the poor, the young and the old, to be his followers. Jesus still comes to those along the roadside of this earthly life. And he calls men and women and young people to follow him. To follow him along the road. To follow him along the road that leads eventually to eternal life. Jesus is passing by. And he says to you, what do you want me to do for you? Let's come to God in prayer. In the quietness, we reflect on God's word to us this morning. We reflect on the fact, the glorious fact, that Jesus, by his Spirit, is here and is passing by. We rejoice in the fact that the Saviour asked that same question today as he did 2,000 years ago. What do you want me to do for you? in the quietness of this place to make our own personal response to that question. Some, we need to see. We need spiritual blindness to be removed. We need spiritual sight and spiritual life to be given. For others of us who by grace know the Saviour, There are areas of our lives that need to be addressed. Heavenly Father, thank you that you graciously heard the words of Bartimaeus and answered his call above and beyond anything you could have asked or imagined. So we pray that even today in this place, People may hear your call and hear your question. Respond, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. May it be so for Christ's sake. Amen. Stand to sing our closing hymn, In Christ Alone.